Hello, thanks for tuning in. This is Mark from Dawn Walker, and I recently had a conversation with the lovely Alec of the band Ghostbound, based in New York, which we thought would be worth sharing for anyone who cares to listen. We've struck up an acquaintance over the last year or so, and have more than a few things in common, it seems. Ghostbound just released their extended play for Sweet Merry Time a couple of weeks back, and Dawn Walker released our album Ages in December just gone, so it seemed a good opportunity to compare notes and talk influences and all manner of things. So without any further ado, here's our conversation. All right. Well, uh, congratulations on the new EP, man. Thank you. Thank you very much. Enjoying it very much. Very. That's very grandiose. Thank you. Very joyous. Thank you. Yeah, there's a there's a there's a definite uh, expansiveness to it. For sure. Which is kind of by design. I think all I think that'll always be sort of a not a hallmark to put it like that, but definitely, definitely our our calling card. I think the same thing of you guys as well. There's definitely there's a definite sound going outward kind of quality to <laughs> hopefully don walker's sound as well and um which is why like as soon as uh, I, I think it was a uh, eric thomas from teeth of the divine um who reviewed the crestfallen ep he, oh, that's cool. and he sent me he sent me a message on on facebook he's like hey i i these guys you know it's like i heard you know it was specifically the mount erie cover because i don't think he was familiar oh, at all with um elverum or any anything of that sort he's mostly a you know pretty straightforward metal guy mm-hmm. and he um he's like it's the first you know other than you i've never heard a guy singing cleanly over blast beats like this <laughs> I was like, oh, cool. I'm, I'm always like interested in decent, in good, clean singing over heavier music. It's still very much a taboo in metal, isn't it? <laughs> it is. And it, well, it is. And it also, it, it shines a light on what sort of bands most metalheads listen to, right? Like, because clean vocals as a concept, I think, falls under a very specific frame of reference to a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the things I always joke about is when, and when, and I've said this in many interviews, is when I get, you know, a Dream Theater comparison. Oh, God. Uh, that's, that's the right reaction. That However, <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? It's very apparent how as soon as someone hears clearly sung vocals and clean vocals as a term, I, li- I kind of like to expel just because mm. it's singing, right? <laughs> you know, it's singing as we've done since we first figured out how to bang sticks together right hopefully it's just a a person singing um and but a lot of the times people's frame of references kind of fall under the prog metal milieu including but not not limited to the likes of dream theater and and the like and um and but what i what i have had to learn very the hard way a lot of the times is that you know, it says people who like your band also like Dream Theater. I'm like, well, they mean this as a compliment, right? Mm-hmm. So I have to yeah, definitely. suck it just, up. Just take it. And say thank you. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, so Eric Thomas gave, yeah, sent me the Crestfallen EP and I listened to it. I was like, this is terrific stuff. And I kind of went down the rabbit hole with you guys and I just kind of listened and immediately bought everything that you guys had oh, up on Bandcamp. Yeah, not realizing true. that you guys had been around for quite a while. Well, uh, sort of. We haven't, point. we haven't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like off and on, like kind of, you know. Um, and also with the, the Sacred Sun connection, which I became aware of far later than everyone else did. Like, right. like I saw the second Dane's photo for the second record long before I became aware of the first one. Really? And yeah, I just wasn't, my ear wasn't to the ground. I didn't understand, I didn't know. And oh, uh, when, so I read, when I read more about it, I was like, this is fantastic. I love <laughs> the fact that he's toying with what black metal should be oh for sure that i really appreciated people often assume i mean i can't speak for dane but i think there's this automatic assumption that he was sort of like trolling the black metal world or whatever and he was trying to send it up but i don't think that was really the intent i don't think he had any idea it would blow up (laughs) i I think i like i think simultaneously i feel that there's a very personal thing that he was trying to express there and on top of that it was also funny as hell because it just looks like someone's <laughs> random Instagram photo. It is funny. It still makes me laugh now. <laughs> yeah, it's so good. And when it started pissing people off, that's when I realized he was doing something right. Um, because making making black metal chuds angry is something that I 
try to do on a daily basis. Exactly. You know, <laughs> it's just like fighting as a I, good fight. <laughs> fills me with glee to know that these people are made uncomfortable by such an innocuous thing. <laughs> the, the, out, the outpouring of rage at stuff like that is, is oh, it's hilarious. Great. It's the sort I love of it. 4chan sort of the QAnon 4chan of the internet, yeah. of the internet. <laughs> so yeah so getting into Dawn Walker I was like okay I hear this sort of kindred spirit in the music not so much in terms of actual sound but in terms of you know the idea of getting across some manner of image or atmosphere mm-hmm. um, in painting a picture with sound which is all I've ever wanted to do oh for sure and uh yeah, like and and also the they had that element where the songwriting to me was at once familiar, but I couldn't put a handle on who exactly your influences were, which is right. which is I think one of the the best things I can say about a band because I get there are bands in our similar scene, and I was going to be careful not to name them, but I don't really care at this point. <laughs> uh, one of them is Wilderun. Oh, they're they're that. getting pretty big. They got they got signed to Century Media recently. Oh really? Hmm. Um, so they're they're. They're kind of scouring the, scouring the tippy top the at big the moment. time, yeah, big time. But they, a lot of my buddies are just gaga over them, and I feel like they're one of those bands that, while impressive, it, to some degree, I feel like they wear their influences really far out on their sleeve. Like I can right. hear, this is the Opeth moment. You know, this right. is, this is the Final Fantasy Seven orchestration moment. Well, we all have those moments, of course. And for me, like obviousness is something i try to avoid um wherever possible i guess you probably just just shouldn't be that conscious about like if you're influenced if you're that consciously sort of being influenced by somebody i guess that's not i kind of came at metal in a slightly different way because i didn't i I, I, of course i listened to metallica in middle school and things like that but i also listened to depeche mode i think i got songs of faith and devotion when i was nine (laughs) Uh, on cassette and then i was like you know i quite like this sort of uh airy chimey chorus pedal laden guitar thing i wonder what other bands do this so then i got a copy of disintegration by the cure and i'm just like okay yeah there's no going back after this disintegration is such a big record for people at every generation isn't it it's like people find that record and then everything changes and so you know that this kind of chimey open string arpeggiated guitar sound once i heard this i was like yeah i was like this is a i think this is it for me this is kind of where this is the path i'd like to go down got into the reverb cave and you're gonna stay there now we judge our distance by the light of the moon in prayer the dry land will be inside soon I had this this uh, effects pedal. It was a Korg multi effects processor. Right. But all of the effects, I were all named after specific artists. Like the delay was just called the Edge, and <laughs> my favorite one was the Rush effect, which was just <laughs> just the chorus pedal. But that was nice. before I knew what a chorus pedal even was. <laughs> and, was, and I was just I would just chill on that constantly and thinking like this sounds warm to me. This sounds like home. You know, There's a band that everyone sort of assumes that I'd be into, and I'm just not. Yeah, it's not into Rush. I love just, Rush, man. No. I love Rush. No, I'm a yes guy. You're a yes guy. Oh man, yeah. See, I, I appreciate. I'm, I'm the. I, I appreciate yes, but I, I wouldn't say that I'm. Uh, like in terms of those prog bands, I would say they're probably among my least favorite. <sighs> I like a lot of them. I like a lot of them. I love uh, Genesis. Love Genesis. Even the Phil Collins stuff. I love most of it. Uh, King Crimson is a huge band for me. Yeah, of course. Marillion, huge band for me. Really? Huge, huge band for me. Yeah. But not Yes. Yeah, strangely not Yes. I, I like uh, Yes. That's the thing. I like Yes. I appreciate okay. them. I even have a, I have that triple LP live thing that they put out and it took me forever to get through it. <laughs> so like, um, I, I certainly don't love everything that they did, but they, they in that same sort of f- first prog era along with king crimson they just made a f- two or three classic sort of benchmark records that just set the the style for uh, like i just don't think rush have ever done anything that yes didn't do on one of those records well i think Ru- i think rush really embraced their pop side really early on like they in in a as a guy that likes a good pop song right 
Yeah, Rush was a huge band for me. I like pretty much all eras of King Crimson to me. My favorite, one of my favorite ones is Discipline. That's one of my favorite really? oh, Crimson that's, records. That's such a sticking point for me. I don't know why. But you know, he um, Fripp wanted to change the name to Discipline, didn't he? He didn't consider yeah, he did. it King Crimson anymore. And like, no. I kind of that's kind of how I feel. It's like it's a different band. You know why I like it is because it's the first time he has another guitarist to contend with. Right. And there's clearly fun being had. Like if you see those old videos of Elephant Talk and uh, Frame by Frame, they're like it's you don't see Robert Fripp smile like yeah. ever, yeah. <laughs> except in those, except in the where he's like kind of really playing off of Adrian Ballou and Adrian Ballou is like quite obviously a uh, an infectiously sort of positive person and like the, he's a the goof. live shows are hilarious it's he's almost a total talking goof. heads esque <laughs> yeah well he played with he played with them <laughs> and uh, I think I think he got a lot of his stage presence from David Byrne it was a lot of the, a lot of what the early metal bands I got into straight out straight away weren't necessarily Maiden or Priest or any of the any really of the big four outside of Metallica early on, but I, I kind of went straight into the the weirdo Norwegians. Like I went straight into Olver and Arcturus and right. In the Woods, especially In the Woods was a massive mm. band for me. You definitely strike me as a bit of a, a connoisseur and a bit of a collector. You've got huge a nerd, wide range of uh, huge fucking nerd knowledge. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no, huge huge fucking nerd. Well, because I also wrote like before I entertain. Oh, sorry, it's cat. This is this is Fellini. Hey Fellini. Say hi, buddy. Now you're gone. You're a good boy. <laughs> um, no, I well early on, while I was kind of amassing all of these influences, I also had, had started uh, writing music reviews for mm -hmm. various for various zines, and all uh, right, from when I was 15, 16 until I was like, you know, twenty six, I would write music reviews. I even briefly wrote for Decibel uh, a couple of years back. Oh really? It huh. became this kind of obsession with me of finding new and exciting music um specifically of this kind of off the beaten path variety like i got really into psy at that time i don't know <laughs> if you're a psy fan but i was huge into psy primordial it's a huge band for me um bathory you know hammerheart it's one of my favorite records of all time nice because all of the all of these bands sort of have this kind of cinematic quality yeah in for that, sure yeah um and as a film nerd, it kind of tied into kind of what I was into, which is kind of painting a picture, you know. Mm -hmm. And I hear that in your guys' sound as well. Like it's, um, um, in a like I love the production on Ages because of how clear but rough some of the guitar sounds are. Oh, thanks. It's always a difficult balance to find the sort of clean versus because I mean. Always, what happens first is you just dial in these horrible, nasty metal tones, and it, it's always a bit of a, a battle for me to kind of dial it back and think, no, it, it can be cleaner. There needs to be some space, and without, you know, the balance between heavy and melody, basically. Right, and uh, well, because I remember when I was recording all this Phantom, when I was recording the first record, because I, I did everything except for bass and drums on that record. It was the first time I had helmed a record. First time I had, you know, it was just me and the engineer. Mm -hmm. And I remember the engineer just pulling my game back so much to the point where I had to step in a little bit. <laughs> and he's like, but he explained to me, he said, well, once we start adding compression and we mix it, you're going to want that definition. Right. Um, I eventually kind of got him to, you know, move it over <laughs> somewhat in the right direction to, <laughs> to the point where we could find that balance. But um, that was a, like, learning what works in a live setting versus what works in the studio oh, for sure. very different but yeah this uh this idea of uh <clears throat> image through sound without being hokey atmosphere because i think a lot of the problems that i, I run into when i listen to post-rock and post-metal mm -hmm. with some exception is that it's like the idea is you know you put a delay pedal on a guitar line and that's atmosphere yeah, for sure. And, and I find that really prosaic, and, and I'm not always reminded of anything when these bands... Yeah, one one of the things that. I fear the most, actually, is um, you get these reviews about those type of records where they say, it's like the soundtrack for a film that hasn't been made yet. <laughs> 
And what they mean is that, like, it's sort of a generic landscapey melange right. of emotion. <laughs> if, if I ever get that, I'll probably just quit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm I I like the idea of that statement. Like, I you know, having a cinematic quality to one sound is something that I go for. But it's like, you know, there comes a point where it's like. Oh yeah, this is the, the you can. It's very clear that this band listened to a lot of Godspeed You Black Emperor and Explosions mm -hmm. in the Sky, and mm -hmm. um, when that started to kind of move over into the metal realm, which was kind of really start like people point to Isis and Neurosis for that. That was really done by Agalock, I feel, who are buddies of mine. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I, so, so it's like I because rem I rem I remember when. I got the mantle as a promo when it came out. I'm in the thanks list for that. When did that come out? Like, because I got into them way later. Two, I believe. Really? Hmm. Yeah, because uh, Pale Folklore came out in '99, and I had it then. Right. Um, maybe later, like a couple years later, they ended up being becoming pretty good friends of mine. I'm still in touch with pretty much everyone except for John, um, which I think is about the norm. <laughs> but um, really, like, that was kind of. There were no other metal bands really combining post rock with with metal. Right. Aside, like maybe Neurosis, Isis was kind of not. I think Oceanic hadn't come out yet. Yeah, that was what two thousand two, I think. Two thousand two, two thousand three. Yeah, around there. Great record, amazing record. Mm -hmm. um, but it was still. It was like then it started to really kind of. A lot of the hardcore bands started to slow down, you know, <laughs> and right. kind of do and there came a point where you know if cult of luna and all, all these other bands and i i listen to these bands and i get why people like them mm -hmm. and i but i'm also just like i'm not necessarily reminded of anything other than just a bunch of dudes playing heavy music in a room together there's yeah. a there's a there's a time and place for that right mm -hmm. but there are there are a couple bands of that style that are really li like um i don't know how big they are in the uk well they're they're british British collective, but it's uh, the uh, you know all of the Alex CF bands like he did Fall of Ephrafa. Right, no, I don't um, really know them. Well, he there's this one one guy named that goes by Alex CF, and he is um, a visual artist. He does these amazing uh, these amazing paintings, and he's also a lyricist and a storyteller and vocalist, kind of a growler for a bunch of different bands. And he kind of first came to prominence with this band called Fall of Ephrafa, which were founded as a means to explore the mythologies in Watership Down. Oh, hang on. Mm -hmm. What are the names of some of his other bands? Uh, he's got, he's, he, had, he had a band called Lightbearer, who were That's awesome. That's the one, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, yeah as Lightbearer soon as you and, said that. Mm -hmm. um, Lightbearer and Fall of Ephrafa are both amazing, because there's like such a clear sense of world building. Mm-hmm musical world building to it in addition to just this kind of amazing mythology explored in the lyrics yeah and that's the that's the other side of it though that's an actual narrative isn't it like that's kind of what i've always gone for rather than just so much having people just project a sort of vague idea of a landscape or something onto it it's right. like that it has this narrative content in it if you want to dig that far mm -hmm. yeah it's there if you want it that's the thing exactly. <laughs> ultimately because it like for me, like as a listener, lyrics are not necessarily the most important element, but when they're good, it's it enriches the experience, right? Sure. It, like it makes it, it, it kind of everything sort of falls into place and feeds off of one another. You yeah. know, I wouldn't say either All Is Phantom or, you know, Extended Play for My Sweet Berry Time are necessarily concept records because the lyrics don't really tell a straightforward narrative of any kind, but mm -hmm. I feel like they're all part of the same world in some way. That's probably what drew me to black metal as well, just in, as a concept. Oh, absolutely. Definitely. Is because it, was, it was the atmospheric stuff that drew me in to begin yeah. with. Yeah. Because there's something about, you know, a trem picked riff over a blast beat that just sounds like an elemental force, right? That just sounds like the wind. And that when was really done right. <laughs> when it's done right, right. And, it, and that was really apparent to me when I first heard Transylvanian Hunger. 
you know, and I, uh, and I was like, I'm in a snowstorm. That's, that's exactly what's going on. <laughs> and being buffeted by a blizzard while somebody screams at me. Um, <laughs> and oh, the first Ulver record, Bird Tat, that was oh, that man, to me. It's so good. But that's a, that's a different world. That's a, like a world of sort of folk horror. In a sense, but it's part, I think it's like, there, there's, they, even when they, I think they were all like, the median age of that band at that point was like 16. Yeah, that's crazy. So good. And I be, I think they knew what they were doing sonically. That's the thing. It wasn't just dumb kids who didn't know how to work a Nev console or whatever. It was literally, they had they had this thing that they were trying to accomplish. And it was doubly true of Natten's Madrigal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when they, they really knew what they were doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and And... You know, talk about divisive records. I, mean, yeah. <laughs> I love that record, but yeah, me too. Um, something about you know using production as an instrument. Um, there are friends of mine, fr good friends of mine, who have bands of their own who don't feel that it's important that tone and production are are necessarily considerations for enjoying you know good music. Right. And I uh, I I will often fight them on this because I do feel like. Yeah, a good song is a good song. If you strip away all of the the layers and distortion and reverb and everything and just have a person with an acoustic guitar and it holds mm -hmm. up, then yeah, it's a good song. But, um, you know, so much of that dictates the color and the landscape. Of yeah, I mean, why, why, why not have both if you can? Yeah, yeah, I mean, so it always, it always annoys me when I hear good sound good songs too shitty too clear too clean too antiseptic loud for the sake of loud kind of production right um and, and why I, like i, I, I even today i listen to so much shitty bedroom fucking drum machine black metal that it's like <laughs> um that barely competent <laughs> barely <laughs> that it's like it, it, that I, but i'm i'm always taken somewhere I'm always taken to somewhere beyond myself, somewhere beyond my immediate surroundings. Um, and I, it's something I always appreciated. Um, obviously, like I draw the, like I draw the line at like <laughs> the very real vetting process that goes in when you find a new black metal band oh, for and you're sure. like, and you're like, you're like, should I do more research on this before I share it to my social media? Yeah. It's a, it's a dangerous game nowadays. You have to know the dog whistling, which I had to teach myself. Like, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and get, get into some slippery situations when you don't know the dog dog whistling. I speak from experience. Yeah, and there's yeah. you know there is also because of the tendency for black metal artists, especially solo artists, just to remain these sort of enigmas, wordless mm -hmm. album covers, and blah, blah blah. It's you often have no way of knowing. No, not at all, and unless they're explicit in you know we play anti-fascist black metal. Oh, what's the other similarly named? Don Raid. There you go. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. great band. Really good band. Uh, I think Dane is buddies with those guys. They're from the north of England. Mm -hmm. Where are you from in England, by the way? Me? Uh, I'm from the south coast in Hampshire, near okay. a town called Southampton. Okay, nice. C city, town, somewhere in between. Yeah, nice. But yeah, Dawn Raid. Not... What a great band. Yeah, really good band. I'm kind of wondering when we're going to get a new record from them it's been a while i kind of get the impression there's a lot of people sitting on records at the moment because they don't want to put them out until they can book tours so they can tour and support them man i feel like people should be recreating and releasing and doing as much as they can to get to release new music just yeah i can't i can't wait i know i do know people specifically that are waiting and i i just can't like it's can't. agonizing no why would you sit on something that, uh, like i mean to give you an example, like all this phantom had this kind of 15 year <laughs> journey from when I started it to when I eventually released it. And by the time, like, I think I finished record, like I went in to record everything after all the songs were complete. Finally, uh, it was about like a 12 year period. <clears throat> I think I tracked everything from September of 2015 until like August of 2016. Right. And it was mixed and mastered by August of 2016 wouldn't come out uh all of 2017 we were like a, i was just chomping at the bit to get this thing out <laughs> and not hearing anything and it was finally released 
by a shitty label <laughs> in uh, in uh because <laughs> I went with the I did I did what so many young mu- younger musicians do and I went with the first label that said yes. Right, got to. Um and uh for a variety of reasons it wasn't a good fit mostly politically but <laughs> but <Ooh. laughs> uh but but um we ended up getting the rights back to the record but okay. um it was finally released in June of 2018 so by the time by that time we'd had a, we'd had we'd had a full lineup and we were we were playing live in support of it and it was you know it felt like at the time it was constantly i was constantly clawing upwards to try to kind of shoot this thing out of the nest so that it could kind of fly, but it kept kind of <laughs> sinking right. and falling to the ground. And, I, and no matter what I did, and I didn't have a publicist. I didn't really know what to do in that regard. Mm-hmm. I used all of my contacts from when I was a music journalist. Jur- I'd say that music journalist, person who wrote <laughs> reviews, <clears throat> person who got promos and wrote reviews on occasion. Um <laughs> like I used all my contacts to make, like, I was like, well, the label's not doing, label's doing jack shit Mm -hmm. to promote us. Could have been a lot easier had I known to hire a publicist. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But I was just like, it it was, it was this kind of endless cycle of me not being satisfied. I think that's what first records are for. Here's my life's work. I know. Here's, Here's the thing that I literally cried and bled over right <laughs> i know but that's kind of that's why isn't it that's why the first one is so like precious and you kind of do everything that you can you do all the good and the bad and all the in between and you just kind of throwing everything at the wall yeah and that's exactly what it was and then there was this sense of just like this kind of was released to an audience of none <laughs> and every time i would just like not to do sour grapes that it's all the label's fault because to to their credit you know a month before it was released they did send you know some promo emails out to maybe 20 to 30 zines that no one read wow (laughs) and (laughs) and and they and then 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 they did one facebook post and nothing um oh man that's shame and and so so i was like i i'm i way too proud of this record for it to just sit and languish. Mm-hmm. So I just started kind of for the next six months to a year, I was just kind of slowly pushing it, but it always seemed like it wasn't enough. Thankfully, um, I've learned to manage my expectations somewhat. In, um, <laughs> and so with this new EP, we, we like, like this, this was, was, it was all suspiciously easy, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> like to the point where I was kind of really doubting I was like, is this good? <laughs> like, because like, I, because we easy in what sense? Well, I had all of these songs were mostly already written, right. um, because they all came from that same ten to fifteen year kind of bedrock of, of sounds. Moreover, our guitarist Talha is quite the skilled sound engineer in his own right. Right. So all the pre production was done at his then apartment, where we just kind of plugged into his axe effects and he would put like placeholder drums to them. Uh, I would do, you know, vocal demos there and oh, for, a, for a number of the songs and basic. And by the time we were to enter the studio to track drums, all we had to do was basically rebuild the record. That's how kind of how it should be. I mean, that's how it would have been done in the olden days, except they would have just had a budget to demo and we can right. demo at home now. Right. Um, when we, whereas like, all this phantom was literally i had I had it all in my phone i had per- what so you'd never put drums to them until you went into the studio no oh well, i was with Dude. we did it we did it in the rehearsal space sure but and you never like recorded them and tried no. to rearrange no. and oh dear. never so yeah we it was so by, so then we went into our rehearsal space with our, our um our, our engineer, engineer friend, friend nolan voss who's awesome 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 um he plays in anacon and uh, there's a band called Pyrolatris out here in New York City. Hmm. Dynamic, amazing guitar player, and his just the sounds he's able to get with very little is just crazy. He came in to our rehearsal space, <clears throat> and we mic'd up our amps, and it was pretty much the easiest two days imaginable. We just tracked all of the guitars and bass and overdubs over the course of the following two days. We did a we did this kind of layer of guitar atmospherics where I 
turned on my spaceship of a pedal board. <laughs> All I turned on turned on every pedal, and I, I just started <laughs> making weird sounds, and then. Talha, Noah, and Nolan all s- kneeled down and were just twiddling knobs. Yeah, it's definitely the uh, that sort of bridging thing is definitely something that marks the EP out from the from the album. I think it's much more sort of there's there's a con- there's a very conscious effort to tie every song together. Exactly. Yeah. And someone pointed out to me I, this wasn't intentional, but someone pointed out to me that uh, it can literally the EP can be played on an endless loop. That the the same the same ocean sound that starts it is actually the same sample that's used at the very end so as soon as the end starts and you repeat it repeats itself almost like it's a mobius strip <laughs> yeah it is the endless ouroboros of ocean-based nerd music <laughs> um, um or as i call it frilly shirt metal <laughs> Which brings me to another uh, to another thing that I've that I'm embracing recently is just just being a goof, you know, <laughs> just like embracing what it is just to be me. Which is, you know, I'm a I'm a shit posting. I like to think of myself as a funny guy, <laughs> uh, and and I and so like pretty much everything I I post in some form is going to have some kind of piss taking element to it, and um, that's been really freeing for me. I don't know. I think. If some people were to use this word, they they might mean it as a criticism. But I th- there's something quite earnest about your music, but in quite a refreshing Thank way. <laughs> well, it's it's I, I do appreciate that, and likewise as well, um, because it's it comes from us, right? It's 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 very it's personal music in the respect that we don't lie to ourselves. Mm-hmm. Not so much that it's like all of the lyrics are about you know relationships or broken hearts or deaths in the family although the first record was definitely all about that but um (laughs) but uh but it but it can contain all things and that's why i feel like opening up a record with a major key black metal tremolo riff (laughs) to me is fun i i just i love the like that opening riff for and you and we are already at sea is essentially you know a dissection riff made major <laughs> like that's been stuck in my head for days that riff fun fact terrible riff to play in the studio fucking hard <laughs> riff to play i wrote it could barely do it <laughs> it like the reason why we layered it so much is because we kept fucking it up <laughs> we, yeah i mean we, doing we, doing single string tremolo picking at speed in the studio that's just like all the hallmarks of a thing that's going to be difficult to try there's a sh- there's a motherfucker of a string skip in that riff too there's like there, there it's, it's just like i'm just like I, I it took me forever to get it, and then Tala had to do his. <laughs> yeah, and then Tala had to do his, and he kept fucking it up too. And I'm like, ha 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 ha! I'm like, he's like, he's like, this sucks. That he looked at me, just looked right at me. It was like the one, the one challenge we had was each of us quadruple tracking that riff. <laughs> and I think, I think there was one of each of us had one line that had reverb on it just to mask any mistakes that. <laughs> <laughs> we might have made on it but um, all else fails use reverb always so i would imagine that the release and the pre-production and the reception of this record has been almost a completely different experience to yeah the first one. almost i mean i'm not without i'm not without anxiety uh, you know i'm not without um especially on Bandcamp friday where i just you know come off as come off as the most thirsty human imaginable where i'm just like <laughs> shamelessly plugging it to the point where i'm just, just like, like like I literally had to ask myself the other day, I'm like, is this enough? I think it's enough. <laughs> and like, and like, like, I was like, is it, is it this important that I had so many people are aware of this? And I'm just like, fuck it, do it anyway. Like, what what's the worst that could happen? I think you're probably at this point we're all experiencing a bit of Bandcamp Friday fatigue. Not not that it's right. not a great thing that they're doing, but I think it's but people it's just. It's- the reams of emails <laughs> that they well, wake up and to. You think about it; it's the only way for us to make money, you know, like from our music. I mean, I've I'm lucky enough to be employed with a day job, but um, there is 
you know, as much as I like to say that I don't necessarily care what people think, to some degree that is true, but, you know, I definitely would like people to hear it and like it. <laughs> you know, mm. that's that's intensely gratifying. It just seems like, I mean, I'm very new to the whole sort of black art of PR and all this thing. I'm I'm still very much learning about that, but there does seem to be an element of it which is just kind of a crapshoot, whereas where if mm -hmm. if, if the what's the um what's the word i'm looking for luck of the draw like computer sort of algorithm algorithm thank you whether you you're you just get picked up in the right way not that you yeah. don't have to have a good record right. all, but whether the algorithm algorithm gods are smiling on you that day or mm -hmm. not yeah 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 of course <laughs> no and there were and there were a couple times where i'm just like just I, there were a couple times where I'm just like, why is this, why is this paid ad, this five dollars I threw at this Facebook ad, why is it falling on deaf ears? Like you know, it's like, but then it's just sometimes, sometimes you don't get it on the right day. You know, sometimes it, yeah. it's 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 genuinely hiring a publicist and doing the homework has been something that I've been sort of, uh, sort of welcoming in, in that respect. Hmm. Um, it's it's like strange because it like even something as when you actually the date that you choose to release something is important oh for sure um at the end of the day though i mean as long as you make good heartfelt music <laughs> like it'll find its audience absolutely eventually in some form hopefully. eventually in some form <laughs> hopefully within our lifetimes not one of those <laughs> nick drake situations where it's like <laughs> 30 years later someone uses our song in a fucking car commercial and <laughs> now I think some of that must be slightly out of date by now as well. I, I, like I remember people saying to us that we were speaking to not to release a record in the beginning of December because it would be forgotten about and it won't be on this list or that list and blah blah blah. But you know, all, like all of that seems a bit like it might be not irrelevant, but it, we're so sort of at the whims of internet mm -hmm. culture and we're in, in the middle of a completely unusual situation i'm right. just not sure those rules really apply as much no, anymore. <laughs> probably not so much anymore and in the case i asked the thing i uh, used to describe uh because ages came out at the beginning of december right yeah and and um so it was kind of like too too early to add to the best of 2020 <laughs> too late to add to the best of 2020 and too early to add to the best of 2021 yeah people keep saying things like if only they'd released it in 2021 does I would, it really put matter it when it came out list. <laughs> you put it on so this you still list still can if you like yeah it's still there <laughs> the list is still there it's just it's just six months ago um that's one other thing i've realized as well as how sort of not slowly the industry moves, but how far in advance things are sort of planned and put into the production schedule. Like, like a lot of places ask for promo copies and stuff like eight weeks before it comes out, mm -hmm. and that that kind of thing to me is just all new. I don't like. Right. I'd send it to them like the day it came out or whatever. It's like, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> that's yeah. that's not how they do things. Well, there are also a couple things that like, like the reason why people do things is based in no other reality than tradition, I guess. Not right. tradition in the sense of like family or ritual, but just like that's because that's how it's done. Right. And that's the worst reason to do anything, <laughs> I feel. Well, in, in the in the acting world as well, they said like they said, you know, casting agents will want a physical copy of your headshot and your resume. And I'm like, why? It's twenty twenty. <laughs> and and sure enough, they caught up. So now that's not done at all. But no, it's because of this weird tradition that's based in nothing. Like no, other than maybe at one time, that's the only t the way it was available. Yeah, sure. It's just the received wisdom, isn't it? Yeah, received, that's a good term, received wisdom. Um, but um, I actually wanted to bring up something because um, I because I had this idea that one of the, like just going back to a certain the certain kinship that I feel with your project. Um, the idea of a lack of a better term, a signature song, right? right. A song that is our kind of reason for being. Mm -hmm. And I think of in your, and you correct me if I'm wrong, I think your song is a pagan, is pagan plays. Well, it's all, all hit single.
There's just something, and I, I was listening to the acoustic version, you guys, the video you guys did mm-hmm. um, earlier today, and I was like, because the first time I'd heard it was the acoustic version that was on the Crestfallen EP. Right, of course. And um, and I and I as soon as I heard that song, I, I bet I was like, I bet this is an acoustic reworking of a song from another record. <laughs> That's as soon as I heard, it, I knew it. Good ear. Um, so I so I went I went back and I listened to the previous record. And I was like, I was like, yeah, this is totally their raison d'être. This, this is, is totally, totally their mission statement. I guess so. Yeah, I mean, I, it, it probably wasn't intended as that, but it's kind of become that. And I, th- I think when I was working on it, that was definitely the first song that I finished writing for that record, and that definitely set the sort of style and the tone of it, and that right. kind of gave me license to finish the rest of it. So, yeah, I guess in a way, like, I never yeah. never had those kind of thoughts for it originally, but it, it probably is that. Yeah, you're right. I had a similar thought, because I very consciously wanted the Gallivanter to be our right. signature song. Mm-hmm. And it, in many ways, I think it is. it's the first song i ever wrote to completion right ever um i think i started it when i was 18 (laughs) (laughs) and it literally was written from beginning to end there were no parts being moved around it was just came up with that uh yeah it's nice when that happens isn't it the the rare times the only time literally the only time (laughs) um but that was like sort of the thing where i have this i had this image in my head that it would open every set that we ever play it would uh be the song that people point to and they're like we're like this is how they sound right right um sure i'm obviously nothing goes to plan ever um but i'm thinking then that like i don't i'm I'm like wondering that if that'll change you know in the way in the wake of this new ep if and when the world reopens and we start playing live but but to me like because there's that idea i think in both of the both of our respective songs that it's at once familiar you know the the chord progressions you've heard before right mm-hmm. in some form um there's only so many <laughs> there only it's only yeah right um like we've heard the chord progressions on both you know in some form or another they they're both relatively simple in structure mm-hmm. for lack of a better term um Definitely pagan planes yeah. definitely is it's all yeah, blocks of 16. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it's basically like I'm like, okay, this is in G. This is literally a John Denver song. <laughs> like, um, and uh, it just like, but it's all about kind of what, what kind of window dressing we add to it. It's like, why not put a blast beat behind this kind of C major part? Part, see how, see where it takes it. And, uh, but yeah, no, I, I kind of, I, I. I liked that idea and i like the fact that like if you guys were to play a gig where let's say you play ages in its entirety like you're no no (laughs) (laughs) never (laughs) i did uh i did all this phantom in its entirety once and it sucked (laughs) yeah i can't i i never like it when bands do that i hate knowing what song's coming next but yeah i'm I'm largely the same even if we were to do it as like a one-off sort of fun like one gig type we just there's stuff on there that we just we can't play it like it is on the record it would just because we're we've kind of we've had exploding drama syndrome for about five years now oh good yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) (laughs) and the guy we're playing with now he's great but he's a, a session guy and we just don't like we can't have the sort of rigorous rehearsal schedule to get to the point of like playing all mm-hmm. that back to back. There's just no way. <laughs> this is not on the cards right now. We're we're the are we're aiming eventually. Um, Talha is living in North Carolina right now, getting his getting his MBA. Hmm. Um, and but he, you know, we're 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 able to collaborate remotely, obviously, because we're all somewhat skilled enough at our home computers systems yeah. to be able to record things. But um. Once he's back for over the summer, once he's back in New York City over the summer, we may get together to do extended play in its entirety. But it would have to oh, be nice. it would have to be uh, live in studio. Obviously, we're not going to play live because that's fucking dumb. <laughs> <laughs> like any band that's actively trying to do that at the moment, I'm kind of like 
I was like, good, go, uh, go get COVID. Have, have a good time. <laughs> um, but um, this idea where it's like, we'll present it in a way that makes sense to the, to the, to the record itself, where we'll, you know, we'll have the appropriate lighting. We'll do it all front to back and then maybe close with a couple covers because right. we love a cover. We love a good cover. Yeah, you guys covered the Mannix. We did. We did. We did four stone, seven pounds. favorite albums of all time yeah same here that's a hugely influential record for me yeah, holy bible really oh yeah huge. Oh, I, man. I, 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 i'm so happy not, to hear you say that not even a huge manix fan outside of yeah, that record that's their last that good record <laughs> so incredible yeah, it's, it's so weird how like the guy that wrote no music didn't even play on any records but he was the soul of the band half wrote half of the lyrics <laughs> as soon as he went awol and disappeared and is now presumed dead their edge is gone yeah well i think you could forgive them like one sort of slightly um try and put this delicately like a sort of melancholy sentimental record yeah but they just they never kind of recaptured what made them so good after that yeah well it was mostly the attitude um sure which is the character lack of not attitude attitude implies like snarling punk rock bullshit but and i love I love punk, but but the character—that's the, the term—and and that's a that's another another thing that I feel is somewhat lacking in a lot of our more prog metally be- brethren is a sense of character, just pointless virtuosity. Exactly. Yeah, and and even the even the ones that are impressive, like the band I mentioned earlier, I just I th- I hear a distinct lack of character, and it's not so right. much that I I look for originality at any point because who's original truly Mm -hmm. (laughs) but it is important that there is some at least some kind of some kind of attitude and and or some kind of character which is what i feel is so good about the holy bible is how bleak and disillusioned it is definitely and that weird thin compressed production style on the record that i'd love yeah, but do you? Because there's vastly different mixes for the US and the UK, aren't they? Do you? I don't know. I mean, I have, I had a CD copy that I got when I was in high school. Um, I was, you know, sixteen, seventeen. Because we uh, hear like the the version that we had here is obviously recorded in like quite a small town studio, and it's a punk record, and it's a bit kind of small and bit sounds like the one I've heard. But they did this US mix where they just like made it sound like it was played on a drum machine and just over compressed everything. And it's absolutely, it just kills the album. It's horrible. No, I think the one I have is the one you're referring to because there's this few. Yeah, because it, 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 it does sound like the guitar sound specifically is really quiet. Right. And somewhat thin. And, uh, but there's, but there's an edge to it. There's like a sharpness right. to it. So they have like, I mean, they, the amount of layering on that on that thing too, like subtle stuff going on. Yep. Really clever songwriting. Truly clever songwriting. Yeah, definitely. Just weird, weird riffs and just. I don't understand how Jimmy Dean Bradfield can like just fit in some of this stuff. Like, Four Stone Seven Pounds to me is just a perfect example of a song that explores, that really encapsulates the nature of the lyrics. Yeah, I think he just he just kind of leans into it, doesn't he? And he's he's got the conviction of it that. Holding you, but I only miss these things when I laugh. Yeah. <laughs> he yeah. just goes for it. Well, he, he just, he just it seems like fit. it's not even. <laughs> he's like, gonna do it anyway. Very... <laughs> but then James Dean Bradfield talks about he's like when Richie when Richie James would um, would give me the lyrics. No, Richard Richie Edwards. Sorry, Richie James is the Aphex Twin guy. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, when Richie would give me these lyrics, I'm like, how am I supposed to write music to this? Like, you realize that I'm supposed to be playing and singing at the same time, right? Like, how, <laughs> like how am I supposed to get this phrase out before yeah. the riff changes? <laughs> Joe, I'd love to experiment with that. I'd, like, I, lyrics for me are, are never an afterthought, but they're always the last thing finished. Mm-hmm. They're always yeah. kind of fit to, like, I'd love to start with the lyrics. That would be just one way of working very differently. Uh, Scott Walker, I think, 
used to do that separately too, where he would he would have these phrases that he would just kind of yeah. Put but together. I mean, like the the latest Scott Walker records are like a voice emerging from nowhere with some mm-hmm. set dressing and some mm-hmm. meat punching noises. Like, oh, yeah. I don't mean oh, I don't mean that as a bad thing. Like, I love those no, records. But those are my favorite. Those are those are among my favorite albums ever, actually. But those are was, pretty much just like vocal albums, aren't they? With mm-hmm. with accompaniment. <laughs> yeah. No, not a lot of hooks. <laughs> not a lot of hooks on those records. What are you talking about? Yeah, starting with lyrics would be a fun would be a fun thing. Like, so let's talk about let's let's talk about songwriting really quick. Like, are you always at a guitar? Do you always have a guitar in hand when you write? Not necessarily. Um, about half the time, I'm like you. I do a lot of demos on my phone, just half an idea. But more likely nowadays, I'm sat at a keyboard with a drum machine or a, a synth that usually starts that way. Like nice. A lot more nowadays I'll start with like a drum idea than I will a guitar idea. Because I don't like sit down and sort of pick up an acoustic guitar and just start singing a song out of nowhere. Like that right. almost never no, happens. No, I don't do, I, yeah, that never happens with me. Yeah. I don't know. It's, I, but I, I have absolutely no discipline whatsoever. There's no yeah. one yeah, way that I write a song <laughs> <laughs> ever. Yeah. Generally speaking, I'm, I piece shit together over the course of many years, but... <laughs> coalesce i don't write them they just appear over time mm-hmm. I, that, I mean <laughs> that's pretty much how i how i do it too um however I, i'm going to experiment more and more i feel with like starting out at a keyboard um starting out with rhythmic ideas instead i think it's good to get away from the guitar or for me it is anyway because i i just fall into the same traps i've kind of got these because i play in like an open tuning but so, you do yeah playing like open C like C G C G C E C G C F G C okay and so awesome. it's sort of I, I play a lot of open chords with a lot of repeated notes and I kind of get stuck into these same chord progressions and whatnot uh, mm. open tunings ha- can it's easy to fall into that trap I've noticed yeah. um, well because my other the other band I played in Cosmo Demonic we used to mm-hmm. we played an open B Right. Um, and our our main guy got so much mileage out of that. I couldn't believe how many <laughs> things he was able to write with that. With with that, um, I love open string tunings. I I just find myself I just never find myself writing in them. Right. I think I've written one. I've written one song. Well, like I say I've written I've written the riffs for one song that's going into going to be on the new Cosmo Demonic record coming out in May. Right. Um, but but uh, the, largely it's like, you know, you find, kind of find yourself kind of really chilling on the the open, open string, string element of it, just hearing them all ring out and yeah, I don't, I don't de- know. It's, Devin Townsend style and, and you just kind of get I've I've sort of done that thing to death now. In and of itself, I mean, a, you know, a black metal adjacent record played in an open string tuning is very unusual. That's probably what gives a lot of your guy a lot of your <laughs> your your sound it's identity i suppose because mm. it's not I, it's, I really i really don't think of us as a black metal band kind of no, makes me laugh when we get no but uh, i would say like you know any i like how i mean that is like any band that employs a blast beat here and there sure i mean the definite influence absolutely for the same reason that you know lady scray or alceste can sometimes be thrown into that or even us like, perhaps less so yeah we we definitely like I, I don't think our music is that similar, but we I, we definitely live in the same realm. There's, yeah. there's definitely some sort of Feel commonalities between it. There's common ground. Um, I mean, now that you mentioned Mannix, I mean, I'm just like... The, the <laughs> <laughs> well, is it... I kind of think maybe we're all just disciples of Maudlin of the Well. Is that, oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> is yeah, that yeah, the yeah. common ancestor? Uh, Toby would be very happy to hear that. I'll tell, I'll tell him that when I talk to him. <laughs> Will he? Uh, I'm not sure he will. <laughs> no, Toby's a good dude. I like Toby a lot. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, I'm I've just kidding. Always like that guy. Uh, K- Ko Dot was the last band I saw in California before I knew moved to New York City, and the first band I saw in New York City. <laughs> They've had a bit of a storied time of getting to play over here. Like it's been really like the first time two members got held back at customs and they had to play like a sort of. Seven they played a Tata Lamb show instead of like a <laughs> oh, KO Dot show, and then like, yeah. yeah so it's been, I, I mean, it's tough to tour in the UK nowadays, even I've before heard that. Brexit. 
I've heard that. I've heard. Uh, I I saw an interview with uh, David Eugene Edwards, a Woven Hand, another right. another big guy for me. Um, about how like how it's like whenever he tours Europe, which is six months out of the year, he's yeah. like we almost always skip over the the UK. A lot of bands do. It's it's sad, but it's, it's just so weird like, to me. It's it's, like it's expensive favorite. and difficult to get here. Like I think if people have like drug chart, even just for like possession of weed or whatever, I think it's difficult to get through with our customs. That's and crazy, then man. they come here just to play two or three shows and maybe don't they make that much money. And so it's just kind of not worth it. I think it's like my favorite place on earth. I would like I would love to <laughs> like it's like what like I love visiting the UK. It's one of my favorite haunts. There's a lot of stuff I love about it, but increasingly it's becoming a bit of a fucking clown land. <laughs> <laughs> it looks what I do appreciate at least about the sensibility of of the people of the UK is that you guys are vicious to your politicians in a way <laughs> that like most people in the US really kowtow to politicians I feel I feel like do you think the, yeah you just storm I, the capital <laughs> yeah well I mean with uh, the with, uh, John Schaffer from Iced Earth yeah, yeah. <laughs> He was right there at the right there at his. My favorite thing is like people who were who were like so disappointed in Ice Earth, and I'm like Ice Earth sucked always. <laughs> I reckon he's probably sold quite a lot of records out of it. He's probably got a lot of new fans. Ice Earth was bad from day one. <laughs> like I was like, you guys are disappointed in that your commercial power metal is <laughs> being played by a chud. Um, so what's next for what's next for Don Walker? Good question. Um, you know, we are hopefully looking into shows this summer. We're approaching them very cautiously. We'd like to do that, get out and play some new new songs. Um, like we mostly play around London. We 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 are sort of like a a part time band, so right. try and get out yeah. further afield if we can. And then, yeah, I think it's just even if that doesn't happen for us, just thinking about what to do next, where I can take it next, and just what the next you know evolution of it is right how what's so what's the situation with you over there does it look because i think america is a bit more open than the uk is right you've got restaurants uh, and yeah but we're not like open. i mean my wife and i are both very much ca uh, cautious to a fault almost right where it's like we both yeah we're both fully vaccinated we both have we both got both rounds of our vaccine but you know, COVID's still there. Yeah, of course. <laughs> you know, it's not. It's not like it's. It's not like it's going. It's going away. No one knows nope. really how. How like no really no one is really aware of the efficacy of these vaccines. Mm. So it's like, yeah, we'll we'll see how this goes. But there's also a variant that's popped up recently. Yep. Um, We've got a few actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One of them came here. <laughs> one of them jumped ship. Yeah, so sorry thank about you. That. It's still the same to me until, you know, until we're comfortable to travel, I guess. Sure. Which uh, I don't know when that will be in my case. Uh, so you're hunkering down and exchanging ideas and... Yeah, that's basically all we're doing. And the same thing goes for the, any band activity where I'm writing assiduously for the next LP. Mm -hmm. um, you know, once, once the world reopens somewhat and I'm able to, you know, take the ideas into a rehearsal space with at least our drummer then you know we can start kind of forming those a little bit better because my my yeah. ultimate goal is to make this even more of a band effort mm -hmm. than before because while i kind of lorded over the arrangements on the first record um all of the synth and stringy stuff was all done largely as a band right for the new for the new ep mm -hmm. and i'm like why don't we take this even further and we'll you know i'll, I'll make i'll bring a couple like really pupil ideas for songs and we'll kind of fashion them into a butterfly yeah it's probably healthy it's it's probably somewhere i need to go now that we've kind of got up and off the ground i tell, in fact, I tell you what my plans for this year is trying to get a permanent drama yeah yeah right. <laughs> that's been the ultimate bane i'm surprised to learn that yeah i'm surprised that good drummers are always the hardest of, of any member to hold on to well i think we're we're sadly getting to that point where people are aging out of it and they're becoming sort of slightly embarrassed still to do it or they, or they just can't find the time or just i don't yeah. know what it is but usually and that's why like usually every drummer that you meet will be every good drummer you'll meet will be in six other bands at least <laughs> yeah 
All right, man. Well, I should probably let you go. We've been going for nearly two hours. Yeah, so. yeah yes, we did. It's been, it's been good. It's been a pleasure. Likewise, man. Do it.